In 2024, actress-turned-writer-director Greta Gerwig set a record for being the first director to have their first three feature films all nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. Her debut film Lady Bird also got her a nomination for Best Director and Best Original Screenplay, while her third, Barbie, also saw a co-nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay with her fiancé, whose name I will never get right, Noah Baumbach. And she has shown remarkable versatility in all three films with Lady Bird being a subversive coming-of-age drama, Little Women being a period piece, and Barbie a hyper-feminine blockbuster featuring big musical numbers, comedy hijinks, and scathing social commentary. And she has since been announced as adapting The Chronicles of Narnia for Netflix, branching out into children's high fantasy. With Barbie being the first film by a solo female director to gross a billion worldwide, Greta Gerwig is seen as a trailblazer for women in the film industry, but notice that only one of those Best Picture nominees also got Greta a Best Director nomination to go along with it. The lack of nominations in that category for Little Women and Barbie saw a storm of controversy over perceived sexism, but the latter's was met with a counter-controversy over the apparent white feminism, pointing out that the same Oscar year also saw Lily Gladstone becoming the first Native American to receive a Best Actress nomination, and Justine Triet the first French woman to get a Best Director nomination. You know, in the same category Greta was apparently snubbed from due to sexism. And Greta Gerwig's choice of filmmaking style has not been without its own criticism in the past. See Broey Deschanel's video that is very relevant in the white feminism argument. And the lack of best director nod for Little Women and Barbie could be a matter of quality or subjectivity, since after all, there are ten nominees for best picture and only five for best director, so half of the former nominees aren't going to make it to the latter. Lady Bird seems to be nearly universally loved, no notes, although there is some yikes in how it presents an emotional abuser as simply complicated, but Little Women and Barbie do show certain crutches that the big time directors are often criticised for. For example, Tim Burton is universally agreed to be a fantastic art director, but is known for not being as strong in directing performances, and his frequent collaborations with the likes of Johnny Depp and Helena Bonham Carter is because they can self-direct. So what are Greta Gerwig's crutches that are becoming more apparent with each new release? Well, I'm not a poet. I'm just a woman. Little Women is the fourth cinematic adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's beloved coming-of-age story about four sisters in the March family. Graceful ladylike Meg, dainty wallflower Beth, vain yet charismatic Amy, and tomboyish independent Joe. At the time her adaptation was announced, the most recent one in memory was Gillian Armstrong's 1994 film starring Winona Ryder as Joe, with young Claire Danes and Kirsten Dunst as Beth and Amy, which was initially given the smallest budget out of fear that no one would want to see it, but a rough cut reportedly moved the entire group of studio execs to tears, resulting in more money for reshoots, a 95 million box office gross, and three Oscar nominations. Not empty now. If you can't tell by my enthusiasm, I consider it the best of the adaptations, and I was one of many who asked why another one was needed when Greta's was announced. Besides the three Hollywood films, there were two silent versions, a TV movie, a modern day version, four animes, a musical, an opera, another modern version in the form of a vlog series, and a BBC miniseries released just two years before Greta's film. No one will forget Joe March. The 2019 film distinguishes itself from the others by beginning later in the story, while Joe is trying to sell her book in New York, repeatedly cutting between the two timelines, and giving more emphasis to the other sisters such as Beth and Meg, and introducing metatextual commentary on the publication of the novel itself by leaving it open whether Joe actually does get with Professor Friedrich Baer, a detail that Louisa May Alcott was forced to include when she would have preferred Joe remain unmarried. Well, she says the whole book that she doesn't want to marry. Who cares? I don't think Little Women 2019 is a bad film, and I came away from seeing it in the cinema quite happy with it overall, and I'd say that Eliza Scanlon's Beth felt better rounded than Claire Danes's, and I kinda preferred Emma Watson's Meg as well. Just because my dreams are different than yours doesn't mean they're unimportant. But there are some very obvious flaws that become even more obvious on each rewatch, and especially when you compare it to Barbie. You've been making women feel bad about themselves since you were invented. Barbie is of course based on the famous Mattel doll, and follows stereotypical Barbie, who really should be called prototypical, just saying, who lives a utopian life in the Barbie land matriarchy until she one day starts having irrepressible thoughts of death. Okay, that's my favourite song lyric in the whole film. <laughs> oh, oh, girl, are you okay? These are the results of a grown human woman, Gloria, projecting her own insecurities about life onto her old doll, and so Barbie travels into the human world to help her, 
and what follows is a bunch of stuff that'll give me a headache to recap here. Yeah, I'll say it right now, this was not a film I even remotely enjoyed. And although I found the first act extremely solid, I actually got triggered as soon as this demon child showed up, and getting through the rest of it was a huge slog. We were only fighting because we didn't know who we were. While there were aspects that I liked, and Ryan Gosling was a delight as Ken, I can understand the lack of nomination for Best Director. It looked great though, with a fun internet rumour making the rounds that the set building caused a shortage of pink paint. But that kind of leads me to my first crutch. While Barbie may be the more visually striking film, this criticism could be more accurately thrown at Little Women, which although it didn't win any of the major awards at the Oscars, one it did take home was met with a lot of controversy. And yet you couldn't get the fucking costumes right? <laughs> oh god, they didn't even have a single bonnet in that movie. <laughs> and song is off. <laughs> and, and one of the girls wears Ugg boots! So to clarify, Little Women is a period piece with half its story set during the Civil War, and is to be taken as a super serious one so its list of inaccuracies with the costuming add up to the sisters wearing day dresses made from cotton when there was a cotton shortage during the very war their father is off fighting in, the dresses all looking brand new when the March sisters are supposed to be impoverished and therefore should be wearing hand-me-downs, the girls going bareheaded when it was the norm to wear bonnets and other headgear, and girls meant to be over 16 wearing their hair down and with modern fringes and side parts, Meg's dress here having a neckline that's way too high for the time period, hoop skirts being shown in the second era when they were more fashionable in the first, and finally, Amy wearing f***ing Ugg boots. Now, I'm not one to nitpick costume accuracy in movies, since for example, Bram Stoker's Dracula also won an Oscar for its costumes, but that is a super stylized vampire movie with an operatic tone, while Little Women goes to such efforts to try and immerse the viewer in the time period, to the degree that Greta Gerwig bans smartphones from the set because they didn't exist in the 1800s. You have a publisher demanding that Joe's heroine end the story dead or married and you have Florence Pugh monologuing into the camera about the limited options for women back then. And look, research mistakes happen. I tried to make a World War I film during 2021, and thanks to a really uncooperative theatre, this was what I had to go with costume-wise. But I see this picking and choosing with historical accuracy in so much of modern media, usually to make some pop feminist statement, such as Beauty and the Beast 2017 deciding to differ from the animated version and go for a realistic 18th century France setting, where Emma Watson insists on Belle not wearing a corset because she wouldn't want to be restricted, and Bridgerton being set during an alternate history Regency era where we again get this corsets equal patriarchal oppression message, when first of all, Corsets were not worn during those settings, but rather stays, and the fashion was to look like a Greek column. And second, we'll let my friend Song take this one. It's interesting how the corset especially has become so villainized <laughs> over the years, and people claiming that it was a tool of the patriarchy to oppress women and keep them down, but like, men hated corsets and men were the ones saying they wanted to get rid of them because oh they're bad for you and women were the ones telling them to get lost <laughs> let them have their thing now if i an idiot with access to the internet and more intelligent friends can do my research then surely the director of a 40 million hollywood film can also titanic had such an accurate representation of period fashion that rose's suit here was taken from a french fashion plate only a couple of months before the titanic set sail romeo and juliet 1968 is likewise pretty accurate to the italian renaissance setting franco zeffirelli went with and since film is a visual medium, the number one rule is show, don't tell, and your costumes in a period piece tell us where your priorities were in representing said period. In Little Women, it was clearly having two of the female leads speechifying into the abyss, admittedly very eloquently because Florence mother in pew, that's why, in essence telling us about the time period rather than showing. This extends to the casting as well, since Professor Bear is now played by Louis Garrel, an attractive 34-year-old who seems like an odd choice to play the contrast to the typical pretty boy Laurie, whose proposal is turned down by Joe, and she finds an intellectual and emotional connection in because they are both unconventional in terms of looks. Since Joe is described as cultish and too tall, and Friedrich is overweight and grizzled. 
Since its film, we've had pretty actresses playing Joe, but sometimes they're better thought out. Since while Catherine Hepburn is a classic screen beauty, she isn't conventionally so, and she made a career out of playing women who were unconventional and more masculine, so her Joe is instantly believable. Likewise, Winona Ryder is a petite cutie, but she too was told she wasn't pretty enough to be a movie star, and her performance conveys Joe's unconventionality very easily. It's well thought out with Saoirse Ronan in the 2019 film too, who is dressed in such a way that makes a marked difference, again with a great performance helping bring Joe to life. Joe, I'd be a perfect I can't, saint. I can't, I've tried it and I've failed. Why does everyone I expect can't. it then? Gillian Armstrong was nearly going to cast Hugh Grant as Friedrich in her version, but then realised he was both too young and charismatic. And they went with Gabriel Byrne, who is more attractive than the character is described in the book, but you can believe him in the role. You have me. With all of my heart. Greta Gerwig's response to blatantly making Friedrich more attractive was what we call a gish gallop. I feel like for the history of film, guys have been putting glasses on hot women and saying that they're awkward, so I was like, I can do whatever I want. So in an era where practically every picture we take can be filtered and photoshopped to the point of ridiculousness, the double standards in male sexualization and impossible body standards are hot talking points, and male mental health is at an all-time low partly thanks to the above, this movie took a positive relationship that was about connecting on a deeper level past the superficial stuff, and falling for someone because they're supportive and more intellectually minded, and implied the deeper things were meaningless without the physical beauty. Not to mention that Friedrich gets very little characterization compared to the 1994 film, effectively turning him into a sexy lamp for Joe's story. And the only defense of that is, they did it to us too. But that's far from the only red flag in the Gerwig cinematic universe. I mentioned how the one flaw in Lady Bird was in how the character of Marion, Lady Bird's mother, is presented as merely complicated or tough when she's an emotional abuser whose main mission in life seems to be to chip away at her teenage daughter's self-esteem or punish her for wounding her pride. And we're supposed to instantly cut her some slack when she says her own mother was an abusive alcoholic. This lack of accountability for female characters' awfulness goes up a notch in Little Women. Oh, you'll be sorry for that, Joe Martin! <laughs> you will! You regret this! There's a memorable moment from the book where Amy is annoyed that she couldn't go to the theatre with Joe and gets revenge by burning her sister's beloved manuscript. Compare how the 1994 film presents this with the 2019 one. I'm sorry, Joe. 1994 Amy is already regretful before Joe even finds out, apologises when she sees how she's hurt her sister, and is very clearly horrified at how awful she was, later helping her rewrite it to make amends. When Lady Zara succumbs to the Duke's wrath. 2019 Amy is shown maliciously burning the manuscript one page at a time, gloats about it to Joe, and is unapologetic, even saying she wanted to hurt her. It's not as if I could have hurt you by ruining one of your dresses, and I really did want to hurt you. These incidents in the book and other films show Amy being a brat, getting knocked down a peg because of her behaviour, and realising she has to change, beginning her character development. In 1994, Amy nearly drowning in the icy water is a sad moment because we know how sorry she is. In 2019, my reaction is, just leave her there. Not to mention that when Joe accidentally burns Meg's hair off, 1994 Amy quickly tries to help her by offering a ribbon to cover it, and 2019 Amy just laughs cruelly. It doesn't help that in 1994, Amy is clearly a little girl and can be cut some slack. Whereas in 2019, Florence Pugh still plays her when she's supposed to be 13, Again, making her come across as an unrepentant mean girl. Jo is no better, with a scene where she asks for feedback on her writing and doesn't like what Friedrich says, so she blows up at him and gets very personal. My reaction there some truth indicates in. that you are a pompous blowhard. He's a bit blunt, sure, but he's not rude, and he's pretty constructive. Oh, I think you're talented. And her response is to insult him and declare they're not friends and I don't want your opinion because I don't like you very much. Jo hates the inequality between men and women so much that she declares it multiple times in the film. She doesn't want to be coddled, she wants to be treated like an equal, and yet when Friedrich does, this is how she reacts. Who made you high priest of what's good and what's bad? That is not merely complicated. And like Amy, Jo never has to be accountable for this. There's no moment where she's regretful for her rudeness or has to admit how her temper got the better of her. She gets a letter about Beth right after, returns home, and then Friedrich seeks her out later, meaning she never has to have her potentially abusive behaviour checked. But just you wait. Okay, Barbie. 
Let's do this. I mentioned getting triggered in the Barbie movie by Sasha, the resident girl bully who is absolutely vicious to our main character and reduces her to tears. And I sat through the next half of the movie in complete bafflement that this rotten demon child never received any comeuppance, or had to face accountability for the fact that she states to be a bully at school and is this f***ing cruel to a complete stranger. I mentioned in another video how we stopped getting what Yara Zaid called killer click movies like Heathers and Jawbreaker in the 2010s, because what we used to villainize we now present as the ideal, hence unaccountable mean girl Amy. And Greta Gerwig insisted that Barbie was really a mother-daughter movie, yet neither Sasha nor Gloria receive a proper arc. Sasha comes around to supporting Barbie rather suddenly, with no reflection or challenging of her anti-Barbie views, and in fact Gloria doesn't seem to even know what a bully her daughter is. And look, in the military they have a saying, shit rolls downhill, meaning if her daughter is a bully then it's not coming from nowhere. Where is the arc of Gloria realising that her own issues were affecting her daughter's behaviour, and how she needs to step it up as a parent and maybe discipline Sasha, or find out the reason for this attitude because… If she's this cruel to complete strangers, how bad is she to people she knows? An actual mother-daughter movie, Freaky Friday, does a pretty good job at examining both perspectives, with Tess having to experience the bullying her daughter gets at school, what work goes into her music, and that the bad boy love interest is actually a decent guy, while Anna sees her brother and stepdad to be in a new light, and finally communicates that she's so combative because she's still afraid of Ryan replacing her late father. Similar as Mean Girls, also directed by Mark Waters funnily enough, which humanises the girl bully by having Regina and Katie get knocked down a peg and humbled before they can begin their redemption. Regina has to learn that the entire school hates her, and that someone she thought was a friend tried to ruin her life, while Katie gets shunned by the entire school and called out by the people she'd previously looked up to, having to take action to prove that she is no longer a mean girl, so that her redemption feels earned. Oh, and I guess we're okay. Barbie, meanwhile, is furious at how Ken has taken over Barbie land, yet she has no problem sharing a car with the demon child that called her a fascist and made her cry. Sasha's meanness is just sidestepped because it's hard being a girl. Being a bully is a-okay because it's impossible to be a woman. And that's Greta Gerwig's brand of feminism. Zero accountability for bad behaviour because being a woman is hard, but we have an entire section for that. Greta Gerwig has a reputation as a filmmaker who makes fiercely feminist films, which she undoubtedly got by having unconventional female characters who often monologue into the abyss about the difficulties of being a woman, but do her films go any deeper than that? Maybe it doesn't seem important because people don't write about them. Little Women attempts to weave metatextual commentary on the importance of women's stories in our society, which yeah isn't a message I disagree with, but the choice is to parallel things with the publication of the original novel. The main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Or dead. The film introduces a straw man publisher who gets a scene wondering whether anyone will want to read Joe's novel about her and her sisters, only for his three daughters to burst in having read the manuscript and demanding to see more. And this kind of statement hinges on the myth that there has never been any kind of entertainment for women, and if there was, it was rare. Beauty and the Beast 2017 tried to play this one in a much more basic fashion by having another straw misogynist punish Belle for teaching a little girl to read. Teaching another girl to read isn't one enough. This was again poorly thought out because female illiteracy was not a thing in the time period the movie takes place in, and in fact the original Beauty and the Beast fairy tale was published in a magazine for women and the novel Little Women was not the passion project Louisa May Alcott had to fight to get published because men don't want women's stories to be told. She was told to write it by her publisher Thomas Niles, who felt that a novel about girls would have wide appeal. She only cobbled together something modelled off her own sisters after pressure from her father, saying to a friend, I could not write a girl story knowing little about any but my own sisters and always preferring boys. Get this. Little Women was written because two men pressured a woman to write it because they thought it would sell. There have always been stories and media for girls. Little Women received its first Hollywood adaptation in 1933, and its second in 1949. Who do you think those movies were aimed at? The idea of the male-focused narrative as the default is considerably more recent than a lot of people realise. The golden age of Hollywood recognised women as consumers too, and big budget films were released for them under the studio system. Gone with the Wind was a spectacular event movie where the main characters were Scarlett O'Hara and Melanie Wilkes, and the male leads were their love interests. 
Now Voyager was a big budget melodrama about a woman's story. Imitation of Life 1959 invested one million dollars into Lana Turner's wardrobe in the hopes of drawing a large female audience. It wasn't until the studio system collapsed in the 60s and we saw the rise of auteur filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, you know, who were making stories simply personal to them that we saw a shift. And even then, this stuff goes in cycles, since although the 1994 film had trouble getting greenlit, the 90s would see a rise of female-led films and shows. And even before then in the 80s, there was still children's programming for girls such as Jem, My Little Pony and She-Ra. The 2000s is considered the least friendly era for female entertainment, but remember Freaky Friday? That was greenlit because The Princess Diaries had been such a hit, and suddenly mother-daughter movies were bankable. The issue of female-led superhero movies was more because those blockbusters required large budgets, and execs were unsure about investing into something that hadn't really been done consistently. Yes, there obviously was sexism at play as well, but in entertainment, the money always takes priority. That's a Terrible idea. Yeah, that's going to make money. Oh, yeah. uh, Ordinary Barbie, I love it. So Little Women 2019 ignores all this nuance and complexity and goes for a simplistic message of the patriarchy doesn't want women's stories told because that's more marketable. Now that's not to say female novelists have never faced any obstacles or that Jo herself never did. For example, Emily Bronte's only novel Wuthering Heights was met with shock that a woman could write such a grim story and Mary Shelley had to publish Frankenstein anonymously and when her gender was revealed, she was met with critical response like this. The writer of it is, we understand, a female. This is an aggravation of that which is the prevailing fault of the novel, but if our authoress can forget the gentleness of her sex, it is no reason why we should, and we shall therefore dismiss the novel without further comment. Well. The issue there was that these lady novelists were stepping outside the appropriate genres and spaces expected of women, and even Jane Austen had to publish all her books anonymously during her lifetime, since a woman writer was only supposed to view writing as a sideline, and prioritise being a wife and mother running her household, because chasing the celebrity status that came with being a successful novelist was taboo. Jo likewise has to publish under a male pseudonym because her stories aren't appropriate ones for a woman to be writing, meaning not romance. Likewise, authors such as Essie Hinton and J.K. Rowling were encouraged to use their initials out of fear their books wouldn't sell if it was known they were written by women, because they were more gender neutral. But the flip side has male authors sometimes using female pseudonyms when writing romance or even young adult fiction, where a female author would be assumed to be more comfortable. The 1994 film tackled this issue with Joe not being outright rejected, but told to try the women's magazines. And Laurie highlighting that Amy can mooch off Aunt March and her eventual husband to pursue her art, while he as a man is expected to be a provider. Which reinforces that it's not so much, men hate women, men suck, as men and women are expected to fit into these narrow boxes. Isn't that awful? But then we get to Barbie. The first basic pop feminist touchpoint is that Mattel in the film has no women on the board, for the simplistic message of hire more women, that'll solve everything. What would have been more revolutionary would be to unpack that issue a little more, like how some women are hired only for the appearance of diversity and inclusion but have no real power, or how the standards of perfection can be much stricter if you're a woman in charge such as female directors having their careers set back years by only one flop. Or even that sometimes the biggest problem can in fact be the other women protective of their spots. I've worked with more than one woman who's outright said they're more comfortable in male-dominated spaces because there's less cattiness and mean going. Good luck putting that in a mainstream blockbuster without getting cancelled for hating women. Barbie similarly has a very simplistic attitude towards feminism and women's issues by having the real world be one where every man she meets is a stereotype, instantly feeling self-conscious while Ken feels validated. Like, there is no way anyone could walk around dressed like Ken and not receive massive amounts of mockery and ridicule. Is Greta Gerwig unaware that homophobia is still very much a thing? Of course not, because this brand of feminism relies on the fallacy that men have no problems at all and that in society, being male trumps being female in the social hierarchy, completely ignoring other issues such as race, class, sexuality and disability. Greta herself is a celebrity white woman with a net worth of 12 million, so are we going to claim that me, the autistic nobody with barely a fraction of that, is automatically more privileged than her just because I'm a guy? We could also argue that Beyonce is more privileged than the two of us in some areas. And since I can never not drop a charmed reference, 
The debates surrounding the attempted progressive reboot highlighted this when Sarah Jeffrey took offence to Holly Marie Combs and Rose McGowan slating it because they weren't supporting a woman of colour-led show, perhaps not considering the possibility that, as a pretty young twenty-something, she and her other cast members might have some more privilege than them in terms of ageism, which is still a big problem in the entertainment industry. This is what we call intersectionality, something white feminism dislikes immensely because it requires us to look at things with more nuance than simply playing the clout game of who has it harder. Because men have all the power! Barbie's attempts at commenting on gender inequality reminds me of the infamously terrible remake of The Wicker Man, which changes the antagonist from a pagan sect to a matriarchy in an attempt to show a persecution flip, but the comparison doesn't really work since all the men have their tongues cut out and are ritually sacrificed, as well as having no power at all, which aren't really things in the average patriarchal society. And Barbie draws so heavily from The Matrix, yet shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what that movie is actually commenting on. Neo is unsatisfied with his life and willingly goes on a journey that will change his worldview completely and open up all new challenges that will ultimately be worth it because he's choosing to be his true authentic self. Yeah, it's quite effective as a trans allegory, created by two trans women before they'd come out and transitioned. But there are significant differences between the plot beats that Barbie references, such as the most obvious red pill blue pill shout out. Neo has a genuine choice, with the blue pill representing the antidepressant Prozac, and his option there would be to take something to nullify what society would dismiss as just a mental illness to be trained and medicated out of you. The red pill represents the hormone estradiol that trans women took, and at the time of the release came in red capsules, with Neo's option there being to begin his path to becoming his true authentic self, leaving behind the name he was given at birth and taking one he chooses. My name is Neo. When Barbie is given the choice, she chooses the blue pill analogue and is then told she doesn't have a choice and has to take the red pill, which gives a bit of a yikes for unintentionally playing into the myth of forced transitioning. I'm ready to forget now. Barbie also doesn't want to escape her life in Barbie Land. She wants things to stay as they were, and only goes into the real world because she's told that's the only way to do that. And The Matrix is all about bringing down the system so that everyone can be free. Barbie does the exact opposite by making the happy ending about rebuilding the system where Kens were second-class citizens and giving them only a little more power. Kens will have as much power and influence in Barbie land as women have in the real world. This is very much a trying to have the cake and eat it too situation, which is what makes it more pop feminism. Since to achieve true equality, both sides would need to give up the double standards they benefit from to allow for a level playing field. There are no trade-offs in the resolution to Barbie, where there is still an imbalance of power, and the Kens are only given the scraps and expected to be happy with it, with that same weak justification of they did it to us too, using an abstract they that allows for an entire group to be easily written off. And the attempted parable on gender inequality completely sidesteps the issue of race. Despite presenting Margot Robbie's white blonde Barbie as the default that everyone else is an extension of, this is nothing new either, because second wave feminism was notorious for excluding women of colour and queer women. Are we seeing that portrayed in a blockbuster? Check out Jesse Earle's video because I'm basically going to start repeating everything from that. I can't think of a segue, so let's just jump straight on. Lady Bird got praise for being subversive by being a coming of age story where the teenage girl does not end up with either one of her love interests. And Greta Gerwig continued that theme into Little Women and Barbie, which both take a canonical romance from the source material and subvert expectations by not having the characters get together. Romance is still present in the films, and Little Women admittedly leaves it open rather than outright stating Joe and Friedrich don't get together. But remember how I said earlier that Greta Gerwig's female characters often go unaccountable for their bad behaviour? The men aren't exempt from this either. I'll be good for you, Saint Amy, I'll be good. The romance that still forms a major part of Little Women is younger sister Amy growing up and marrying the March's childhood friend Laurie, who initially pined for Joe and proposed but was rejected, only later realising that Amy was the one he should really be with. For context, the book was published in two parts, hence the two timelines. After the first one came out, numerous readers wrote letters to Louisa May Alcott demanding to know if Joe and Laurie would get married, so she deliberately put him with Amy to spite the rabbit shippers who were missing the point of Joe's character. The 2019 film with its anachronic timeline attempts to work the Laurie-Amy attraction to the story earlier, making it clear that they will end up together from the very start. Unfortunately, it decides to add some… stuff that is extremely red-flaggy, 
and pretty disturbing in light of how this adaptation is hyped up as the most feminist because Amy and Joe speechify into the abyss about the difficulties of being a woman. I waited an hour for you. There's now a sequence where Laurie is supposed to pick Amy up at her hotel for a party and he stands her up. Later showing up at the party drunk and barely dressed, with two other girls on his arm, publicly embarrassing her and Fred Vaughn. Fred Vaughn, ladies and gentlemen! In his first scene, he also makes a show of jumping on their carriage, planting an unwanted kiss on Aunt March, and going out of his way to make this old woman uncomfortable with his lack of propriety. He also judges Amy for being a social climber, whereas his book's counterpart gently questions her plans, and it's motivated by wondering would she be happy simply marrying a rich man she doesn't love. Perhaps you're fantasizing about spending Fred Vaughn's fortune. Okay, the first incident, a person does that to you, run like hell. Not only does this version make Amy even worse as a child, it turns Laurie into an absolute jerk. And their romance is suddenly an I can change him fantasy. You've been drinking again? Why are you being so hard on me? It's 4 p.m. Well, someone yes, has thought... to do it. Maybe they thought they were being feminist by having a strong woman command a man-child into maturity, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way in real life. And Joe's maybe romance with Friedrich has a few red flags too, what with him just sitting there and being unfazed as Joe insults him and gets personal because she didn't like his feedback that she asked for. What? I thought you wanted honesty. Barbie has minimal romance beyond playing the overdone cliche of Gloria having a man-child for a husband, but there's a very weird imbalance of Barbie apologizing to Ken at the end and him not doing the same. Not every night had to be girls' night. The in-universe justification is that he only did what he did because the Barbies oppressed the Kens first, which is a take. That's not how empathy works. It's supposed to help us understand someone else's perspective, not excuse it. But even so, this whole third act is full of multiple yikes, since the Barbies' tactic to overthrow the Kens is to manipulate them with their feminine wiles to pit them against each other. Yeah, at this point I knew the movie was not going to redeem itself for its messy second act. Once again, check out Jesse Earl, who put it much more eloquently on the yikes for the movie implying that this is women's default state. And moving into my final point of contention. Around the time the Oscar nominations came out and Margot Robbie was passed over for Best Actress, while Ryan Gosling and America Ferrara got nominated in their more colourful roles, a friend of mine stated that the awards don't like to recognise good acting so much as most acting. And for all my gripes with Barbie as a movie, I cannot fault anything about Margot Robbie's performance. And she had the hard role here. Ah! Oh. Acting is about more than performing a scene intensely. It's inhabiting a character completely and telling their story in a way that's most effective for it. In fact, a frequent direction I've gotten in the past is less acting, if that makes any sense at all. It's the same with directing. Good directing is telling the story in the most effective way for that particular film or episode or whatever. And I saw a Tumblr post sometime last year that talked about how we have a serious problem with media literacy these days. And I'd argue that it started way back in the 2000s when film and TV criticism shifted to be primarily online, and progressed to be in a way that prioritised quantity and immediate clicks. A film that's been a huge victim of this is 500 Days of Summer, which many a bad faith critic has accused of promoting an unhealthy view of women. And like, that's what the movie is about. The movie spells it out quite well, but the cynic in me thinks that if it were made today, we'd have to have Summer or Rachel monologuing into the abyss on how Tom's view of women is wrong and declaring the message lest anyone miss it. Heavy-handed storytelling used to be considered a bad thing, hence why everyone loved to make fun of Volcano for attempting a moral on race relations like this. Look at their faces. They all look the same. Greta Gerwig's films have received praise for foregoing subtlety and having her characters speechify the message for the audience. And hey, I don't mind a good speech in a story. They're fun to watch and fun to perform as an actor. And I'm going to insert a wild comparison from my days in pro wrestling that will probably only land with about 10% of you. A speech in a movie can be a lot like a high spot in a match. <laughs> what we call a high spot is something spectacular to make the crowd pop. A good high spot is made even better when it serves the story of the match and has been built to properly so it's the absolute necessary next step in telling that story. But one without that same build-up and organic connection to the story will usually be dismissed as pointless and criticised for favouring flash over craft. It's cliché to say that less is more, but sometimes less is indeed more. Take the climax of Christine Jeff's 2008 indie dramedy Sunshine Cleaning. Mom? 
Rose has been harboring angst for most of the film about her mother's death as a child, and how she's felt she has to take care of her less responsible sister ever since, as well as some other stuff about needing more help with her own son. In this scene, she talks to her mother, and although extremely emotional, Amy Adams doesn't go for screaming or intense crying, but the sadness is instantly conveyed. I don't know if you're in heaven or not. The speech isn't particularly long either. Comparing it to Amy's speech about marriage as an economic proposition in Little Women, it wasn't in the original screenplay, and Meryl Streep thought of it, thinking that an audience needed to understand a woman's powerlessness in the era. So its main function is to tell the audience about Amy's limited opportunities, and show that her choice between Laurie, who she loves, and the wealthier Fred Vaughan isn't just her being a gold digger. So don't sit there and tell me that marriage isn't an economic proposition because it is. Except, why is she telling Laurie this? Laurie is part of the same class as her, and more so, since he's richer. He knows how society works because he's in it. Men weren't ignorant of women's roles in society, so using Laurie as the audience surrogate doesn't work here, especially since the rules of society had already been established in this comedy exchange between Joe and Aunt March. You'll need to marry well. But you are not married, Aunt March. Well, that's because I'm rich. And Amy's conflict in the story isn't a choice between love and money, because whether she picks Fred or Laurie, she's still set financially. I feel like they were trying to draw from pride and prejudice here, and not really understanding the conflict that made that story work. The Bennet sisters need to marry well, because Mr. Bennet is getting old, and the entailment on their estate means that with his death it'll go to a distant cousin whose charity they'll be dependent on. The Bennets are only middle class, so they aren't bringing the advantage of a good name to a potential marriage, and their problems stem from Mrs. Bennet being such an embarrassment in public that she nearly ruins Jane's potential engagement, Mr. Bennet not doing a good enough job educating his youngest daughters on how to behave in society, Mary being so antisocial making her unlikely to meet a good husband, and Lydia likewise nearly ruining herself and the family because she's so spoiled and naive. The March sisters don't have this conflict because Meg is A-OK -okay marrying the poorer John Brooke, Joe can support herself through writing, and they have a mother who says, better be happy old maids than unhappy wives. And there's no entailment here. Joe inherits Plumfield from Aunt March. Amy's conflict differs from Lizzie's in that she doesn't have to worry about compromising her morals for her own survival. Amy never struggled with that sense of identity the way Lizzie or indeed Joe did. Amy wants a rich husband because she wants a lifestyle of stability. She's happy to work within the system. So this attempt at weaving a message about patriarchal oppression comes at the expense of character voice. What are you going to do with your life? <sighs> Polish up all my other talents and become an ornament to society. Joe's speech to Marmy may be equally as heavy-handed, but at least has the justification of a young woman venting to her mother, and does tie into the conflict of Joe wondering whether getting married because she's lonely is conforming to society's view that women need to marry. I'm so lonely! But again, the movie tries to have its cake and eat it too, since Joe's loneliness is most obviously rooted in want for romantic love. And for the movie to leave it open whether she goes after Friedrich or not means her arc goes unresolved. The attempted parallel to real life doesn't hold up because, yes, Louisa May Alcott didn't want Joe to be married, but then again, she also didn't want to write the book in the first place. The message is put before the plot. The message is that women shouldn't be forced to marry if they don't want to, but the plot shows Joe not finding fulfilment only in being a published author, and she gets lonely enough that she reconsiders Laurie's proposal. So this open ending feels very much like Joe cutting off her nose to spite her face. The worst fate is to live my life without you in it. The Joe in this story declares that she's lonely and goes to accept Laurie's proposal, showing that she does want companionship, and she is very clearly sad when she learns he's married Amy. I think we would have killed each other. <sighs> yes. It reminds me of when Once Upon a Time attempted to weave pop feminist commentary in at the expense of what the story needed. Regina Mills ending the series being crowned as the good queen of all the realms. On paper, it sounds feminist that she ends the series without a man and in a position of power, but Regina never wanted to be queen, and only became one because her abusive mother murdered her true love to force her to conform to her ultimate plan. What Regina did want was love, and yet her happy ending doesn't feel so happy because she's still alone. This attempted metatextual ending for Joe feels bittersweet, with an implication that she didn't marry the one guy she actually liked despite her loneliness. Sure, she may have stuck it to society, but at what cost? And then we get to Barbie and the America Ferrara speech. I'm just so tired. 
Regardless of how valid what she says is, how does this connect to the story? Barbie doesn't want to become human or join the real world at the start of the movie. When she starts having her existential worries, she wants them to go away and for everything to be as it was. When given the red pill blue pill analogue, she chooses the blue pill without a second thought. She goes to the human world and has a horrible experience that makes her want to go back to Barbie land immediately, and her whole story once she returns is about trying to get her old life back. There is no moment where she sees the benefits of becoming human. While there is the very sweet scene of her meeting the real namesake for the doll and seeing the beauty in ageing and living a mortal life, the rest of the time the movie is practically torturing her with how awful the real world is. The real world is forever and irrevocably messed up! Well. Tangenting off again, people would be surprised to learn that another of my favourite Lord of the Rings characters is Arwen, but of course going more off the movies. Her choice is a little similar to Barbie's, since she is an immortal creature who considers choosing a mortal life to be with Aragorn. She nearly gives up hope and leaves Middle-earth after Elrond gives her a vision of the painful future in store for her if she chooses to stay, namely that the grief of losing Aragorn will be so painful to her that she won't be able to go on anymore. But before leaving, she has a vision of the son she and Aragorn would have, and decides to stay, because the positives of her sacrifice outweigh the negatives. If I leave him now, I will regret it. Barbie never gets to experience the good things about the human world. She's never conflicted about going back to Barbie land in the second act, which would have made for a more coherent arc of her weighing the pros and cons of being a real woman, and Gloria's speech would then validate that the negatives with becoming real are things that every woman struggles with, but worth it in favour of the positives. And it makes no sense why this would be what deprograms the Barbies, because they have no context or understanding for what Gloria is talking about. Why doesn't she say this to the Mattel execs instead to convince them why people would like her doll? The speech is obviously well written, which is why it resonated with so many, but it's a well written Instagram post, and doesn't work in the context of the story. You are so beautiful and so smart. Gloria starts speaking because Barbie needs validation for not being a doctor, scientist or president, and it seems to be her attempt to reassure her that she is just as valid being pretty and aspirational, but then Barbie proceeds to not want to be that, and ask to be made real. I want to do the imagining, I don't want to be the idea. What does the speech do for Gloria? Does it give her the self actualization she needs to stop projecting her insecurities onto a doll? Probably not, because she then has to have Mattel make an affirmational doll rather than an aspirational one, seemingly having learned nothing and needing external validation. The message seems to be that being a woman is hard and a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, but everyone is still valid. The plot, however, says that Barbie isn't valid unless she changes herself, and that Gloria isn't valid until she has an affirmational object she can tie her identity to. The speech is incongruous with the story. It's there to give the intended demographic something to cheer about, prioritising iconography over storytelling. I really struggle to write a conclusion on this because I don't even know what I'm saying here. I've always personally disliked being put on a pedestal by people I know who can't see all my personal flaws I fixate on, and on the flip side, putting anything out there on YouTube is leaving yourself open to criticism. And while no one likes to be told bad things about themselves, I'm always grateful that I'm never universally praised, because the aim should be to open a discussion and give voice to as many opinions as possible. And when you're worshipped without question, you're really not growing as an artist or creator, and if we're going to make the industry a more equal place for everyone, we have to be able to call attention to what we do and don't like without resorting to the lazy, you just don't like this because you hate women responses. Greta Gerwig has plenty of strengths as a director. The fact that she's made three consecutive Best Picture nominees and has a very passionate fanbase indicates that she's doing a lot of things right, and she will likely continue to do so. I just hope that, as one of the auteurs who has the rare tentpole success outside of the MCU these days, the direction she brings the industry in is a positive one.